Just being here getting all these questions today and things is making me excited about making film, you know. <laughs> you remember what a lovely job you're having, a great yeah, job I you're can do. I know that I can do it and, um, you know, uh, I'm not on any job at the moment, so, I, you know, I'm kind of in that, in that place where I'm going, well, maybe I should. You you're know. 69, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm still... But you're not stopping. No way, no way, no, no. no. I still remember driving back from seeing uh, United 93. Uh, I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. During the film, I had buried my nails deep into the armrests. Yeah. And I was in the plane with the passengers, with the, the hijackers. And the reason I think the impact was this big is, of course, the events mm -hmm. post 9-11, the director, Paul Greengrass, yeah. and yeah. the cameraman. That's you. <laughs> so how did you manage to make me wrench in agony? It's such a great film. It's a masterpiece. I tell, I tell Paul that all the time. It's like, it is a masterpiece. It, but obviously, when you're doing that, you don't know exactly what you're doing. Uh, except we took all the right principles, I think, from the journalistic background, Paul, and the documentary background I had, and the, uh, like a strong visual approach to, to what we, well, it had to be strong to match the story and it, then it all fell into into place like how do we we need a plane and, if, and strangely enough a plane was being broke brought to Britain to be broken up from America and then I came up with this idea that we should shoot uh, consecutively uh, overlapping cameras and let the action carry on and I've got to say I did that because I didn't know a means to make a film like that where we stopped and placed the camera and had act, and had some people's dialogue between two people, and then move across the aisle and see some reactions. We had big, heavy 35 mil cameras and shot uh, full format, so they were only run. If you put it in your hand or made it light enough, it was four minute takes. We had to overlap those takes with so two cameras running, one for four minutes, then another. Then after two minutes, the second camera could come and join it. Then that camera would have to reload, and this one could move up a little and then we would duck down into the aisle and we would reload under the seats and the other camera was filming now and it would carry on. And so it was never a moment where we'd had to break the, the, the overall action of the film. So you, you, you constantly uh, got drawn in and in and into the story. Were you at the Tribeca Festival screening? No, I saw it in the Netherlands. All right, okay. So we were there in Tribeca when it was screened for the first time and the families all came. And the film ends, it ends on that very, I don't know, this score, this note that drops, drops you into the, you know, and fades to black. Perfect ending for the film. And then it's like seven, intentionally, there's like six or seven minutes of titles that roll to give you the time to not have to speak to someone or get up or do something. But you could, they could hear wailing from across the room in different places. about capturing reality, but that doesn't seem to be that important right now in Hollywood. Uh, 
mm. to Scorsese it isn't even cinema, it, it's a theme park. Yeah. Do you sort of, I, I can see in your eyes that you agree. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, well, there's a, you know, I think the, the concept of what, what is real and what isn't is, is very blurred in the whole world, in the, you know, in our politics, in, you know, we're in a place where lies are more valuable than truth. And, uh, you know, for someone who's tried to make their career and life and their art form into something that tells the truth, you know, working with Ken Loach. And the, I've been asked you know, today, how do you pick the directors you work with? And like, no, they pick you. And we all work together because it's, it's an understanding that we're coming from somewhere of, of reality and of understanding and of humanity and a, and a, a wish for a better world. And that's why I've worked with great directors, because I've let the world know that I'm okay at doing this kind of thing. Not just the visual thing, but the, the I'm on, I want to put my hand up and say, I, at least I'm on some kind of the right side of history. Many directors tell me that the best bits in their films are mistakes. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a cameraman, somehow you must be able to capture those Encourage mistakes. it. Or even encourage <laughs> it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, you might call it a mistake to say, don't, let's not rehearse, let's shoot, shoot. And that shot becomes the best shot of that scene. So, yeah, uh, or things go wrong and you, but, you know, I'm able, technically, I, I mean, you know, in, developed a process which comes out of Ken Loach being further back outside of the circle like we're doing here now. Uh, you know, it, we could, it, some filmmakers might have might do this same very same thing by putting one camera here facing me and one camera there facing you. And you talk to the little cross on the on the map box and I'll talk to the cross on the you know that's but that's a method of filmmaking. Charles Scorsese is in everybody's films just about. But, but when you work with the directors, when you suggest, we well, just always keep outside the circle. We shoot over the shoulders. There's always something between us, you know. Uh, you know, you, you can break that rule, but you can. That's the fundamental thing. So with Ken Loach, it was an always from the same observational point of view on a on a prime lens, a fixed lens, and you would follow it around. And it's that's a very passive observer, and it's appropriate for his films and it, almost any film you can make in the same way. But I always had, I, the reason I had to stop working with Ken in the end was I, have to, I had to bring this thing which was inside me, which was about this fluidity, they call it sculptural, that you could be, you, can, you don't have to be observing from only one position, you can move. Captain Phillips, please come in. Have a seat. Try my shoe. I'm Chief O'Brien. I'll be your corpsman today, okay? Can you please tell me what's going on? Can you talk? Can you tell me what's going on? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm okay. Are you okay? Because you don't look okay. Are you in any pain right now? Are you in any pain uh, right now? Uh, right there on your side. Okay, let me see it really quick. Can you lift up your arm a little bit? Does that hurt? A little bit? A little bit. Okay. Is it tender? Go ahead and put your arm down. Okay, I need you to look at me. I need you to calm down. I need you to breathe. There you go. Deep breaths. There you go. When we shot Captain Phillips, at the end, we shot three different um, uh, endings to the film. One in back in Boston, where we started our, our shooting, when you know, he leaves from Boston, and he came back to Boston. So we filmed there, and it was terrible. He's on a, you know, he's on a Learjet coming back from, a, from being saved. 
uh, and then we did another one in, uh, uh, in the captain's quarters. And then the real captain, the real ship that we were on in, in the Atlantic Ocean said, um, he wouldn't come here anyway, he'd go to the, um, the medic. Fucking hell, of course he would. It's obvious, you know. <laughs> so we go, oh, okay. And that's that place we keep walking by down on that, you know, on that, that level, yeah. So we, we went down, had a look, put our head around, and there was a, the medic herself was there. And again, oh, this is interesting. Can we do a, she mind if we come and do some shooting? It's here. no, no, fine, fine. So we, kind of, I think we broke there and got ourselves together. And then we started with, put Tom back outside and walked him down the corridor and turned into the, into the medic's office, covered in blood, you know, all shut up and in character. And she knew he was coming. He wasn't like, I'm surprised. But, and, and there's, I think the one mistake we'd made was say, don't cut the shirt. We've only got three of these yellow shirts. That you, so don't do it for the first time. Now that was, that was like film getting in the way of, of the reality, life. Yeah, of life. <laughs> and uh, so, she, so she got him and the first thing she did was like cut the shirt because that's what she would do. And, and then she like, kind of lost it for a moment and, and said, I can't do this. And we just went, Yes, you can. And Tom said, you're, you're going to be great. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. She knows what you're doing. We went straight out and did it again. And then we shot it two or three times. And that's the final scene of the film that gives it a real ending. Yeah. Because she was absolutely real. And she asked all these questions that Tom didn't know were coming at him. Is this your blood on you? Is that, is that, a, is that your cut? Or that, did they have the, you know, are you bruised anywhere? Or, I can't remember the dialogue. But it was the natural dialogue, and he reacted to it as, as an actor. But a, for the first time, I'd ever seen him, unknowing really what he was, what he was meant to do. And likewise, the camera doesn't, it does a documentary thing. It, it, I don't know who's going to talk, so I'm not. You were like, following them, yeah. Yeah, I'm following, following them, the but but you, but then that dialogue ends. So you go like, and as you go there, they start. Again, she starts again. I went, oh, you know. So you so you know from your documentary background, you can't keep doing this. So you hold on a reaction, and you make that reaction as, as interesting as you can. And then when there's that pause, you try and time it and come back for the right moment, you know. And that's, you, I learned that in all languages, that, you know, the rhythm of people's speech is not that predictable, but it's definitely something that you can attach to.